Welcome to Lessons for the Journey. Lessons for the Journey is the teaching ministry of Dr. David Clifton. These lessons from Scripture are designed to aid in the journey of faith and the journey of life. Let's open our Bibles and join today's lesson. This week we are resuming, actually we are completing uh, our series in James. This is part 10. And so if you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to James chapter 5. We'll be looking at the entire chapter today. Lord willing. <clears throat> and I can stick to my notes. We will. Uh, and as James comes to the end of his epistle, he provides instructions on to ostensibly Christian practices, and I say ostensibly because um, in the first instance, we're going to see that he isn't actually speaking to believers, even though he is talking about uh, church-related uh, activity. So we'll look into that. And I've entitled the message today, The Peril of Riches and the Produce of Endurance. So let's look into the scriptures. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Come now, you rich, cry, howling over your mis miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold, your gold and your silver have rusted and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. You have stored up such treasure in the last days. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields. That which has been withheld by you cries out against you, and the outcries of those who did the harvesting have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and lived in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous man. He does not resist you. Now let's pause right there. And we'll come back to the rest of that a bit later. How many of you have headings in your Bibles? No, I've looked at a few different ones this week and I have this. Uh, it's labeled as, as miseries of the rich or it's labeled uh, warning uh, to the rich or something like that. So look at the fourth word. Come now, you rich. Any rich people here? <laughs> you see, that's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Because compared to most of the rest of the world, almost every American is rich. One of the things I learned very early in my trip in Israel, that street vendors all think, think all Americans are rich and stupid. Because <laughs> they'll, they'll sell you a, a $3 item for $20 if you'll give it to them. They think nothing of it. But they, they imagine that we're all just loading, floating around in money. Because to their standard of living, we are. So now, who is James talking to? Rich. And you declare none of you are rich, so we can just pack up and go home now, because yeah. the scripture's not for any of us, right? Somehow I don't think so, folks. James defines those who are rich as those who have more than they need to live. How many of you have a little bit stashed away somewhere? You're not living hand to mouth. You're not wondering if I'm going to have something for tomorrow. That according to James, you're rich. That you got more than you need. You got more than you require for this day. See, that's one thing we forget about. Remember, I told you we'd get through this if I went off my, if I stayed on my notes, and I'm leaving them right now. So. What is the Lord? What we call the Lord's Prayer, the prayer the Lord taught the disciples: "Give us this day, my." Not ten years down the road. Daily. Daily. 
bread. Daily bread. And that's how much of the world lives. And in terms of our dependence on the Lord, that's how we need to live. But now, let me get back to where I belong. James is defining the rich as, again, not in anyone who has more than they need to live. And he condemns them, not for being wealthy, but for misusing their resources not using them the way they should have. How many of you have heard that money is the root of all evil? How many of you know what scripture really says? There you go. Exactly. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil. All sorts of evil. And some by aspiring to have it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The love of money. Nothing wrong with having money, particularly when you realize it's the Lord's money and He's just loaning it to you. There's nothing wrong with having money. It's what you do with the money that you have. James here, he's inviting the rich. What does he say? Cry, howling over your miseries. These are the things that he sees coming their way because they don't even know about them right now. They're living comfortably and well. They are completely oblivious to what's coming down the road to them. He wants them to recognize the consequences that are coming their way as a result of the way they have misused their wealth. From the Lord's perspective, if you read in the scripture, their riches have rotted. The idea of the Greek word there is to putrefy or to become completely corrupted. And their garments is a symbol of wealth. You know, flashy garments and particularly purple and with gold threads. And it, that was an extreme sign of wealth. Their garments are moth-eaten. You left the wool coat hanging in the clothes for too long without mothballs or whatever else. You come back to it and there's... Maybe they're small holes, but it's still moth-eaten. Not something you're proud to wear anymore. That's what the Lord is saying, except the idea he's got here is that the moths have had a really good meal and perhaps half of the garment is gone. And he says, James says, your silver or gold and silver have rusted. Now we know that precious metals don't rust, do they? They get tarnished or one thing or another. So scientifically speaking, James can't be right, but he's not speaking scientifically, is he? He's speaking symbolically. Symbolically. And he's even using hyperbole, exaggeration, when he's speaking. Because if James has said, your silver and gold are tarnished, you have thought, okay, I'll give him a polish and, you know, rag out and polish it up, it'll be fine. But that's not the idea. It wouldn't have carried the same visual picture. And that's why he said it's rusted. Imagine, he could have possibly said, because some, uh, at least semi-precious metals, will corrode. Uh, so he could have said something like that, but it's still not the same visual picture that he's talking about. So he wants us to imagine that things have corroded to the point of uselessness. The gold and silver that they were trusting in so much. <clears throat> and if you notice, all of the things that people are putting their trust in, their garments, which were uh, symbols of their wealth, their gold and silver, all of these items are subject to decay, to theft, to loss. You know, they can be taken away from you and they're just gone. You can lose them. And they're just gone. There's no security in them whatsoever. James wants his readers to imagine the loss of absolutely everything they hold dear. He wants them to think that way. And symbolically, at least, with their fine garments in tatters, to the point they'd be ashamed to go out in them, their gold and silver has become, become complete, completely worse, worthless as a testimony against them for the poor choices that they have made. Choices that will, according to Scripture, will consume their flesh like fire. And again, James is using symbolism, but he's using a symbolism 
because fire destroys even more rapidly than, than corrosion or rust or anything like that. So he's saying, you're trusting in your wealth. You're trusting in all these things you have. Imagine it's just gone because they're all corruptible. They're all subject to loss. They all fade away. And yet that's where your trust is. Don't do that. And he goes a step for, further in verse 4. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, that which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcries of those who did the harvesting have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Just one of the names for God. So there, part of the riches at least, part, are gained by oppressing the people that work for them. A man comes in and does away a day's labor and doesn't get a day's wage. And that's something that was absolutely forbidden according to Old Testament standards. And remember, James would have still been writing to a mostly Jewish community, so they would have known these Old Testament standards. Leviticus 19.13 says, You shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired man shall not remain with you overnight until morning. You hire a day laborer, you pay him at the end of the day. That's the law, what the law required. And these people weren't doing that. Oh, well, I don't have it with me. Let me, I need to go get my money bag, wherever it is. And you keep making excuses and you never pay them. So that would be a direct indication that while the people that in this particular case James is speaking to are most probably Jews so that they would understand and know the law, they obviously are not God-fearing Jews because they're not abiding by the law. They're not following what they were told, and they are taking their workers' wages and using it for their own gain. He continues in verse 5, You have lived luxuriously on the earth and lived in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. So you've stored up treasure in these last days. Because remember, throughout the whole New Testament, it was the last days. Actually, as confusing as it becomes, the last days are from Christ's ascension to his return. So that's an awful lot of last days. But every generation has just known that Jesus' coming was right around the corner. But I'll get into that a little bit deeper in a minute. These last days, figuratively, you've accumulated silver and gold and all these expensive clothes. You've fattened yourself by cheating the people that you've employed. And these are the things that you choose to bring into the end time, to the day of slaughter. But see, that day of slaughter wasn't a matter of consideration to them. They didn't care about it. It didn't mean anything to them. They weren't even worried about it. They were so self-indulgent, so self-involved. The idea of there being any accounting for their actions, just it didn't even enter their mind. Verse 6, James goes further. You have condemned and murdered the righteous man. He does not resist you. Condemned and murdered, these are words that would lead you to believe that um, they've taken them to court. Because the condemnation is a legal term. Um, and it's the next step in the sinful progression of the rich. I mean, the hoardings lead, led to fraud. They stopped paying people. And that led to an abundance and then to going further self, absolute self-indulgence, <coughs> pardon me, and then overindulgence that overtakes the rich to the point that they, they uh, will do anything. They'll do whatever it takes to maintain their lifestyle. Their lifestyle becomes the most important thing and it doesn't matter who they hurt or what they do, they're gonna maintain that lifestyle. And so the implication is that the rich were using the courts to commit judicial murder, if you will, and so thereby, even through the courts, defrauding people to whom they owed money. Now here, 
James is talking to a group of individuals who have attached themselves to the church. That's using our word, not theirs necessarily. But it's clear from their actions that these are not true believers, at least we certainly hope so. No, these are people that were attached to the church, to the group. Perhaps they were, the term we would use in our day, they're networking because of the church. Well, I need to go there because there's some people that if I get, get in good with them, then it's going to help me with this, that, or the other thing. And I want you to make sure that you understand the scripture nowhere says it is a sin to be rich. It is a sin to misuse your riches. Say, for instance, you inherit a great sum. You know, your proverbial rich uncle dies and now all of a sudden you're a millionaire. Nothing sinful about that. You just happen to inherit a lot of money. Going forward, what you do with that money may become the sinful part. But having the money itself is not. Because, you see, the Bible, while it does not teach that it is wrong to be rich, Jesus himself expressly forbade the hoarding of riches. What he said in Matthew 6 is, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now it is prudent to have a little bit set aside for emergencies and all of that. But hoarding wealth in case something comes up. Notice I said hoarding wealth in case something comes up. Or whatever word you might use shows a distinct lack of faith. If we're not careful, we're going to wind up telling God, well, I have to depend on myself, God. I can't depend on you because something might come up and I better have made provision for it because you, you just couldn't handle it and, and I don't want to be a burden to you or whatever rationalization you use for that type of thing. Paul wrote to Timothy on that subject in 1 Timothy 6 beginning in verse 17, this time, command those who are rich in this present age, in other words, the folks that have got some money right now, command them not to be haughty or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Command them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of... Behold, we count those blessed who persevere. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruits. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now look at that. 
Therefore, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. Now, it seems to me that, uh, although I think perhaps the pendulum is starting to swing back just a little bit, that in recent years, the Christian community, I put that in, in quotes, has given very little thought to the second coming of Messiah. It seems like we've been too occupied with convincing those around us that, oh, you need to be our friends. We're not that much different than you are. And you, you just need to come be part of what we're doing here. We have such a good time. And, and we do mostly the same things that you do. Just so come and be with us. To which the unsaved person is saying, well, if you're just like we are, why do I want to bother with you? I have a whole lot better time with these folks over there. And we've been so busy doing that. Because, in truth, can we talk about Jesus and be what he wants us to be? And be almost like them? Please shake your head from side to side. No, we cannot. Because after all, again, I, I repeat, if we're just like them, why should they bother? Some of us are of a certain age that we remember a few decades ago. Actually, it's probably getting to the point I might should say several decades ago. But anyway, some decades ago, there was an extremely keen interest on the return of the Lord. There were bumper stickers about it. You know, you remember the ones, those of you that are old enough, in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned, and those kind of things. There was this thing called a, uh, a rapture button which showed a, a, an arrow coming down and then doing a curve and going back up and this other arrow going up with it. There were all sorts of things. And, and there was a good uh, percentage of the population concerned on these things. Of course, our, our nation was much more a Christian nation. We can't even call it a Christian nation anymore. I think back then we could have a little bit. And we were looking forward anxiously and wondering about it and talking about it. Not so much anymore. I mean, there's a little bit of interest in it. There's a little pocket over here, and there's a little pocket over there, and there's a few people that are... But generally, among the Christian community, not so much. You know, we're, we've, we've got a good life. And we don't want to mess that up. Uh, thinking about when Jesus might come back. See, in the first century, when James was writing, Jesus hadn't been gone long, but they were expecting him back just about any day. Yeah, I mean... We're going to live like he'll be back. I mean, he was just, he's, he's been gone. He was never gone, gone from the disciples long. So it's time he should be back most any time. They were expecting that. And he lived that way. And James here in these verses is encouraging a bit of patience. If you know somebody's coming, you know, they told you they're coming, but I've got to get this in line and that in line. And before the days of smartphones, when you had instant communication, you knew they were coming, but you didn't know exactly when. And so you just you kept looking for it, and you were excited because you really, really wanted to see them. You were excited about that. That's what was going on. And James says, just simmer down a little bit. Show a little bit of patience. And apparently there was a bit of dissension. Maybe this guy saying, I don't think he's going to be coming this week. And this other guy gets upset. What do you mean? He could be here tomorrow. And to the point that it creates a little bit of animosity between them even. And he advises them against groaning. Because what happens is, this brother disagrees with this brother. And finally, he's like, oh, that kind of groaning. Actually, literally, that kind of groaning. In exasperation. Don't do that, James is saying. Don't show that exasperation toward one another. Because apparently, it's something that could lead to worse. And therefore, bring judgment upon them. Instead of that kind of reaction, he urges that one take the Old Testament prophets, or even Job as an example of patience. See in verse 11. Behold, we count those blessed who persevere. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Now, we remember all that and we are sure to tell other people when it's their problems. When it's our problems, we don't tend to remember those things quite as readily, do we? Other things kind of block it out, take control for us. And so then that brings us down to verse 12. And I've got to admit here, as I read this, I wonder, what was James' thought? I mean, why, this seemed just a little bit 
arbitrary, being put where it is. And I know that throughout the epistle, James has talked about being careful that you keep your word. Your word means something you need to be careful about it. He says this four or five times through the epistle. And he's kind of, I wonder if he's returning to that. But I see this kind of interjection just kind of stuck in here, verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. I have to give you a little bit of a background. The only oath to a Jewish person that was binding was an oath in the name of the Lord. Yeah. And part of this has come down into, uh, well, I, I see it a whole lot in, in older westerns and stuff like that, but it comes down, you know, I swear on my mother's grave. Mm -hmm. okay. Something like that. You swear on something, whatever it is, but you're not bringing the Lord into it. So it doesn't hold you. Does it hold you to anything? And that's why, don't swear by all these various things that have become popular in the Jewish culture. To swear by anything except the Lord, because if you swore by the Lord and didn't follow through with it, there were serious repercussions that went by that. So that's part of what James is about talking about. Don't swear by heaven or earth or any of these things, but just do what you say. When you say yes, make sure you mean yes, and when you say no, make sure you mean no. And don't do that any of these other things so that you may not fall under judgment. That's part of what he means because, as I said, he'd made that same or a similar point several times earlier. And I think here as he's getting towards the end of his, uh, what he knows is the end of his letter, he thinks, let me hit this one more time as I'm closing. And he even uses Yeshua's own word. Because let your yes be yes and your no be no is a direct quote from the Gospels. So he was using the, the Lord himself. And next he turns to the matter of prayer and what it can produce. And hence the second part of my sermon title. He talks about suffering. He talks about cheerfulness. He talks about sickness. Without reading that verses 13 through 18 again. Let me just kind of go through. Follow me. He says, if you're suffering, pray. He said, if you're cheerful, praise. Both are God-oriented activities, aren't they? So whatever state you find yourself in, be thankful that you can praise for something if you're cheerful. I suppose you could say, to carry that thought, be thankful that it's not worse than it is if you're having problems, but tell the Lord your problems. Have you gotten angry at the Lord because something particular happens? Come on, don't lie to me. You know my recommendation? Tell him. Because he already knows, so just tell him. Lord, I'm a little ticked off right now, and uh, I need you to, what you better say is, change my attitude. But if we're suffering, pray, tell the Lord, pour out your heart, take all your concerns. Lord, I'm hurting here, physically, mentally, if whatever way, spiritually. Then he goes one further. If, is anyone sick? <coughs> Excuse me again. Call for the elders. Okay, folks, who are the elders? Because elders are not the same as deacons. And an awful lot of churches not now do not have elders anymore. So who are you going to call? Pastor is one elder, and usually there are others that would be recognized kind of in that capacity. And what are they to do? They are to pray, anointing that individual with oil in the name of the Lord. When I was serving as chaplain, actually I still have it, I had to grab it and stick it in my pocket and think about it. A little vial of olive oil, just a little glass bottle about that big and big around with my finger or so. Doesn't hold much, but you're not truly anointing people with oil the way they did the old days. And you're saying, you know, Pastor, normal folks don't do that anymore. Well, in hospitals, quite often it, it was a request. And sometimes, else, but Scripture says do it, and the Scripture doesn't tell us 
at what point in time we're supposed to stop doing it. But we have to keep in mind that um, maybe because we don't do the anointing, we also don't do the praying as much as we should, and that's why we don't see more healing than we should. But we have to remember that oil is both physical and symbolic. Okay? If you're running a fever or something, you're feeling really bad, you call for the elders, they come to pray, and they're going to anoint you with oil. Keep in mind we're talking first century, you know, Palestine, Asia Minor, that area. You couldn't run down to Walgreens and, bottle, and get a bottle of Vaseline intensive care. Okay? Oil was an ointment used much like we would a moisturizer or something like that. As much as it was symbolic of the Holy Spirit and it carried both those aspects. There is a physical healing that was attached with the use of oil. Because as an ointment or something, it would provide some relief. But it's also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so the prayer brings in the Holy Spirit. And you're also bringing a bit of, of a, a bit of physical relief by bringing the oil as well. For many, many centuries, um, the medical man and the holy man quite often had mixed jobs. So the prayer offered in faith as we can take the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise them up. Faith. That's believing. Okay? Now, we can't demand of the Lord, but we can pray to the Lord, and always according to your will. Because he, this is the passage that says it. The effectual fervent prayer, prayer of the righteous avails much. It has great effect. We need to continue to do that. But then when you continue in the rest of the verses, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. Now, Dr. Clifton, you're not going to run around trying to tell us we need to tell other people what we're doing wrong, are you? You, you wouldn't do that. No, I'm not telling you that. James is telling you that. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean what it says? Well, actually, yeah. But there's a problem, you see. Uh, because this is not a popular topic at all. You don't even want to think about telling somebody else some of the things you've been up to, do you? Neither do I. But you see, somewhere, the problem is somewhere along the line, accountability became judgmentalism. Okay? Because what James is talking about is when you could go to a brother and say, I'm having a problem with this temptation. Will you pray with me? And there was an agreement, yes, I will. And you kept that to yourself. And maybe there were one or two friends that you could go to like that and that you felt were spiritual enough to hold on to it. But you see what happens when you do that? The next time I see that brother I shared with, they have the full right to come to me and say, how's that been going for you? Have you gotten victory over that or you're still fighting with that the perceived accountability not judgmentalism judgmentalism is when somebody comes and tells you I've been really having a problem with this and the other thing and all of a sudden the air gets sucked out of the room <gasps> you don't mean that you how dare you what kind of spiritual person are you <clears throat> well, I'm the kind of spiritual person that's having a little bit of trouble, and I thought I'd share it with somebody who cared. You see, the two got replaced. You see the difference of what I'm talking about? I'm talking about accountability where you can truly be comfortable to share with someone the trials, the troubles that you have. How many of you just you skated through this week, didn't have a bit of problem with anything at all, didn't have to bring anything before the Lord? Don't you raise your hand in the life of God. <laughs> That's not how this life works. Would it have been easier if you had two or three friends that you could have gone on to and you said, you know, I'm dealing with such and such right now. And can we go have a cup of coffee? You know, can, can, will you pray with me? 
Can you spare me five minutes on the phone? Let's talk about this and let's pray about this. That's what James is talking about. And so we come together, then we've got more than one person agreeing on a thing. And the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So we need to forget the judgmentalism. We need to remember that we are all human. We are all on this journey called faith. And we're all going to hit potholes along the road. Yeah? If you drop in one so deep that somebody's got to help to get you out. Well, both James and Paul both talked about that. Paul in Galatians 6 says, If anyone is overtaken in the fault, you who are spiritual, help that one. Remembering, and I'm paraphrasing now, of course, remembering that, you know, you do this with humility because you could be there except for the grace of God. And you help them. What does James say here? My brothers, verse 19, My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So accountability. And then he talks about bringing one back. And you notice that last phrase. I don't know in your Bible. It may be all caps or it's probably set aside in some way. That's a paraphrase of uh, Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 20. And that's why it's highlighted that way. But what can actually cover sins? That can only be the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ doesn't actually cover sins. It removes them. Well, what happens? Well, in truth, the only thing that James could actually be talking about is that one of us could come to the one who has fallen, if you want to use that term. And we can urge and guide them into a situation that John described quite well in 1 John. And I, I bet most of you know this verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. Oh, anybody said, no, I, had, I was perfect this week. <laughs> if we confess our sins, now, confess our sins does not mean this is my pillow. And just as I'm getting ready to nod off, Lord, if I've done anything today, please forgive me. That is not confession. Confession comes from a word that means to say the same thing as, to agree with. Let's say you've committed a, a very serious crime and you've reached the point that you just can't stand it anymore so you go here to the Prince George Police Department and you say, I need you to arrest me because I've committed a crime. Well, they want to know. What, what did you do? Where did you do it? Yeah. When did you do it? They want you to tell them what happened. So this idea of, Lord, if I've done anything wrong today, please forgive me, is a cop-out at best. True confession is when you say, Lord, I did this today. And it was wrong, and it broke your law, and it's breaking my heart, and I hope it is. That's the confession part. Quite often with confession comes repentance. Repentance comes from a word that's very simple, but similar those of you that have served in the military will know this one. comes from a word that is very similar to the command about faith. If you're marching or standing in one direction and you're giving the command about faith, you turn 180 degrees and go in the opposite direction. So Lord, this is what I did. And I broke your law and I am so sorry for it. And repentance. And Lord, I don't ever want to do that again. That's your intention. Now you're human. You may wind up being back there again. But at the point in time that we're talking about, Lord, I did this. It was against your law. It breaks my heart, and I don't ever want to do that again. Confession and repentance. What does that do for us? Right there, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive is the word. Should have had you turn there. Forgive us our sins. Okay, and so you're saying, okay, Pastor Taylor, I, I hear what you're saying. We need to confess our sins. So this afternoon you get home, this is bothering you. You're, it's weighing on your heart, and so you get down, and you're really going to do business with the Lord. You find a quiet place by yourself, spare bedroom or whatever, and you start talking to the Lord. And you have this list of things. Well, I did, Lord, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And the Lord's up there listening. So what you confess, he forgives. That's what the verse says, right? But you're going down this list, and the Lord's up there with his list. Well, well, they forgot that time. And, and there's this other thing. And then, but see, the Lord knows our heart. And so when we confess what we know, the Lord sees our heart. This person's trying to be right with me. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's why the verse doesn't end there. And to cleanse us from unrighteousness. All those things we can't remember when the Lord sees our heart and we are confessing what we know. He takes care of those. He takes care of those. And so you might say that the product of endurance is forgiveness. When you endure in the faith. When you stay in the faith. Do you know how God's forgiveness works? Because see, we just read that if we confess, God forgives. God's forgiveness works this way. Psalm 101, start that again, Psalm 103, verses 8 through 13. Talks about Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. That's why we can sin and don't pay for it immediately. Because he's long-suffering. He will not always contend with us, and he will not keep his anger forever. A time will come. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, and he has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. We use the word as a believer this time. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I'm not sure if it's a geography lesson or an astronomy lesson. Imagine if I had a globe, okay? And north at the top, right? And then down here at the bottom of the South Pole. Now, if I leave from here and head north, how far north can I go? I gave you the answer to the question. What's up here on top of here? The North Pole. You see, when I get to the North Pole, it doesn't matter if I'm standing on the North Pole. It doesn't matter which direction I turn, whichever way I go, I head it south. Same thing at the, at the South Pole. So North and South have a definite, measurable dividing line. Okay. Imagine with me that we have a nuclear-powered jet that doesn't need to stop to be refueled. And I take off from Richmond International and I fly east. And since we don't have to worry about fuel, we can fly directly over the Atlantic Ocean. We don't need to do this loopy thing, all the stuff that we do now to save fuel. And so we fly across the uh, we fly across the Atlantic, which would bring us kind of in northern Mediterranean, if I remember. And we fly across, but we get into southern Europe, and then we come across into Asia Minor, and then. We wind up going over the south part of Asia and then China, and we keep going, keep going. And we come across the Pacific Ocean, and finally we get over across the west coast, and we keep flying, we keep flying. When we get back to Richmond, if I keep going, which direction am I going? I'm still going east. It doesn't matter that I got back where I started from. Same thing if I were to go west. So north and south, we can measure. East and west never meet. <laughs> That's how far God removes our sins from us once we've confessed them. But see, there's one I like a little better. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, 
and on their mind I will write them, he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. There's no need for an offering because it's all forgiven. But isn't that a strange wording? <laughs> their sins and lawless deeds, iniquities is another word this year, I will remember no more. Why doesn't the Lord just say he'll forgive them? Have you ever been to the grocery store? You go to the grocery store and you pick up everything that you need and you come back home and you put it in the counter and the milk goes in the refrigerator and the ice cream goes in the freezer and the vegetables, I don't know where they go in your house, in our house we've got a little turntable over here and that's where the vegetables go. And you're going through and you get the last one or two items and you go, I forgot to get peanut butter. How do you know you forgot to get peanut butter? Because you remembered. That's why God doesn't say he'll forget our sins. Because we for, what we forget, we can remember. The Lord says, I choose not to remember your sins anymore. You confess them. I choose not to remember them anymore. You know what happens though? We feel really, really guilty. Something that we've done that really, really bothers us. And we've confessed it. We've done everything the Lord said to do. Exactly like we're supposed to. We've confessed it. We've repented. We truly meant it. We don't ever want to do it again. But it was so bad, it keeps coming back to our attention. You know why that is? Good chance it's the enemy trying to keep you down. Because if he can keep you feeling guilty, he can keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. But when we bring it back to the Lord, we go, Lord... You remember that time when such and such? Do you know what the Lord's answer is? I'm sorry. I don't remember what you're talking about. So why do we continue to condemn ourselves when we have a God who is willing not only to forgive, and see, we talk about, well, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. We've got a Lord that will do both. He'll forgive what we confess, and he'll forget we ever did it. So as far as it is concerned, when Christ looks at us and we're in the relationship we're supposed to be, I'm sorry I said that wrong, when God the Father looks at us and we're in the relationship with him through his son Christ Jesus that we should have, when he looks down at us, he doesn't see our messed up selves. He sees the righteousness of Christ in us. So we need to quit condemning ourselves, except whereas we need to to bring ourselves back to God to confess these things, remember who God thinks we are, and start acting like the children of God, and share one of the best kept, probably the best kept secret in the world. And it's the cure for sin. And we decide we don't want to share it. Knowing that the one, because see, we, we do this, that's why we can go back to that one that has fallen away and we're trying to restore that one, we can tell them all those things I just told you. Look, just come back to the Lord, get right, and you'll be back in great standing again. You can return to the faith and go right back where you were. That is why we share. And when we do that, James says as he's finishing his epistle, doing that covers a multitude of sins. It allows God to cover those sins. So we need to be active. We need to know these things for ourselves and we need to be active in helping others who fall along the way and being ready to support them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your servant, James. Thank you for the words that you have given us through him. Father, as we close and we look at this idea of forgiveness and we look at this idea of helping to maintain others around us, other believers, whether it's through accountability or prayer, lifting up the sick, whatever those things are that James mentioned in that closing chapter. Father, may we be responsible for those. May we understand how you use those things and Lord, what a huge difference it makes as we serve you. Lord, may your Holy Spirit imprint these things upon us and guide us into the lives that we need to, to be the witnesses that you would have us to be for your kingdom and to bring others out of a sinful life into a life of everlasting life. For Christ's sake.
Lessons for the Journey is recorded during the services of Bethlehem Congregational Church in Disputana, Virginia, where Dr. Clifton serves as pastor. If you find these lessons helpful, please click the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Join us next time for more Lessons for the Journey.